right. Welcome back. I hope that everyone had a really fantastic break uh, and had some time to let that uh, the interview uh, and those audience responses uh, wash over you and uh, a little time to process that uh, before we dive in deeper to the Solo Sirens process. Uh, my name is Courtney Helen Ryle, and I'm going to be moderating the next panel. I am a third year PhD candidate in the School of Creative Arts at Trinity College Dublin and actually I'm so delighted. I met Jenny a little under 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, when I came to Ireland to when I was working on my master's program. So it's been a really fun journey and I'm so happy that I can be here uh, for the Solar Science Festival last year and for this uh, event as well. Um, really quickly, just some housekeeping. We are gonna have a Q&A panel, but it's gonna follow, a Q&A session, but it's gonna follow uh, the next panel after this one. So we'll have this panel that's gonna look at the model of the Solar the Sirens Festival, followed by a panel looking at the audience responses a little more in depth, and then there will be a Q&A. But I want to encourage you that all through that time to feel, please feel free to write in your questions, uh, use that chat function. That way you don't forget them. If you'd like to ask your question live, please just type in live and we'll make sure to get to that when we do get to the Q&A uh, portion. Um, so for now, I'm, uh, I think that's all the housekeeping. Yep, it is. Uh, so what I would really like to do is give an opportunity for everyone on the panel to introduce themselves, tell you what their role was, and they're going to respond to a one word prompt, uh, responding to what was the festival for them in one word. Take it away, ladies. <laughs> So, hi, my name is Kira Meehan. I was the festival technician, and one word to describe the festival for me would be inspiring. Hi, my name is Jacinta Sheeran. I was a performer in the festival, and my word is celebration. Hi, my name is Jennifer Webster, Solo Sirens producer, and my word is momentous. My name is Jenny McDonald, Solo Sirens director, and my word is hope. My name is Melody Chedamoyo, one of the performers, and my word is empowerment. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Nicole Rourke, and I'm the writer and uh, performer of Baggage, and my word is excavate. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Nelta Chalamoyo. I was a performer in Falling and my work is enlightening. Hi, my name's Pauline and um, I was also a performer in Falling and my word is substance. Hi, my name is Eve Dempsey. I was also a performer in Falling and my word is belonging. Fantastic. Thank you all so much uh, for taking the opportunity to introduce yourselves. To kick off this panel, um, I'm first going to uh, throw a question over to Jenny McDonald uh, to kind of tell us a little bit more about the model itself so, so that when we dive deeper into it, people can have an understanding of what we're talking about, some context. When you spoke with Joe, you spoke about your inspiration and this idea of extending a model of care and combining your community engaged practice with these solo pieces. And I was really actually, it, it occurred to me listening to this audience responses and listening to the woman saying there was a lot of falling, and a lot of support. And I felt like that was a good uh, metaphor um, for what you were working on. But if you could, Jenny, just tell us a little bit more about this model before we uh, dive deeper into it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Courtney. Um, so I suppose in a way, the model of the whole festival was an experiment in seeing if I could take some of the principles in the devising practice, which you've done as an NYU student um, in the earlier stage of it. But yeah, trying to take some of those principles and see if they could be extended to how a festival could operate. So in the devising practice, we always say, if everybody is curious about everybody else, if everybody wants to help everyone else bring forth their breast and express what they have to say, then nobody has to fight for space because everybody's helping your piece come out and you're helping everybody else's piece come out. Um, and that's what I hoped to create with the collective and with Jacinta and Nicole and my own piece. I hoped that all those pieces could inspire each other, could influence one another, could be part of a, a bigger conversation. And in this case, the conversation, the kind of key question of the conversation was what does it mean to be a woman today? 
But yeah, to experiment with how we could really support one another to present our work because so many festivals, um, especially some of the big flagship ones, you know, Edinburgh and places, you know, some of these festivals, they have their place, absolutely, but it can be ruthless. It's extremely competitive. It can feel really uncreative. And it sort of feels like it's every artist for themselves and every artist shouldering the full burden of the financial precarity and all the other risks associated with presenting work. So I wanted this to be a place where people felt supported to present their work, where people could get inspired by each other's work. And then I wanted the audience to be part of that too. I wanted it to be a dialogue with our audiences um, if they chose to participate in that way. So we had a lot of audiences and we're going to meet some of them after, but um, coming for, for weeks. And that was really exciting uh, because they were part of an ongoing discussion. And then I guess the, um, the mentorship was also very important, mentorship for young women. And then finally, I think something that was really important and kind of experimental was we decided to make it completely a female identifying workforce. And um, that was an interesting choice. You know, I, I, I was curious to see how that would affect the space. I was curious to see how that would affect our experiences. Um, and it's gonna be great to hear Claire's research because we had an academic researcher of the festival and that's part, one of the many reasons I wanted an outside eye was that that was an experiment, you know, and Joe always says everything's a work in progress. But I think one thing that was great about that experiment is we found some new people because often the first people recommended to us for things were men and we had to take time and look a little harder to find the right women and we really found the right women um but it was even that was an interesting piece of learning you know going oh that, okay so that's sometimes we go to obvious places and sometimes we need to pause and take a little time and space to go somewhere different so that's also why the festival happened over six weeks because i didn't want anything to be rushed i wanted it to be something where we could reflect every step of the way excellent uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. And uh, bouncing off of what Jenny said uh, about the collective and this, this community engaged piece, uh, the fi on the final weekend of the festival, there was a really powerful piece uh, following that was presented by a group of, of women who were just, just stunning in their ability and in their storytelling. And um, before we talk to those women, I thought it might be nice if we could know a little bit more about how the collective came together. So Jen Webster, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about how we brought, you brought these uh, fantastic women together to tell this story. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, this is a question that I get asked, you know, quite a lot. Um, how do you find participants to be involved in, in your projects? And I don't we build relationships we don't look for participants and that that's probably something that you know that's very very important to jenny and i in our practice we build relationships never by a call out but jenny and i have been associate artists with talent community arts now for over 10 years and crucial to the practice for both ourselves as individuals and the organization is putting our community first and reaching out to community and constantly building the relationships that we have with individuals, community groups, buildings, organizations throughout Tala and you know, the surrounding areas. Um, many of our participants first came to us, such as Melody Chadamoyo, Naima Rashid, and Nelda Chadamoyo. We first met them through their children actually being involved in projects with Tala Community Arts, and that's how we built the relationship. And then it's come back and said, hey, we got to know you, you know, they've had their fun. Would you like <laughs> to do a project with us? And it's building those relationships all the time. Um, Jenny got to know Aoife Dempsey through the Liz Roach Active Audience Programme of which Jenny led. And that was with Tala Community Arts and the Civic Theatre. And Aoife, I think explained to us afterwards, it was only after doing the Active Audience Programme, did she feel ready to then take the next step to be part of Solo Science? And that was through building the relationship with Jenny and having the confidence then through the work to be able to move forward. Um, one of the story, I, I, one of my favourites, um, Samara Chavy, who is, is a part of our Solo Science Collective and is a dancer. And I met Samara um, at the Dance to Connect Festival at the Civic Theatre, which um, Tala Community Arts were running an initiative to bring youth groups to the festival. And Tony, director of Tala Community Arts, asked me to just check in on the young people when they were there. So at the end of the evening, I went over and I checked in and said, you know, did you enjoy it? And 
this young woman had a look of absolute awe and then a bit of a look of terror on her face. And I was like, <laughs> are you okay? And she's like, oh my God, I just want to dance. This is so amazing. But my mom's going to kill me because I'm really late and I need to go. And I was like, but you got to come back, come back tomorrow. I said, you know, it's all all weekend. And she left and I didn't get her name and she never came back the next day. And I was like, oh God. So I was talking to Jenny about this young woman and I was like, I've got to find her. We've got to find her. She has to be part of Stella's Arms. I had no name. I went back to her youth leader and just said, look, I'm looking for a young woman. She came to Dance to Connect and she has brown hair and she loves to dance. Can you, can you help me? And she found Samara. It was Samara. And Samara came and she was part of Solo Sirens. And you'll see a dance piece by Samara later on. But I suppose it's really important that <coughs> with our collective, it's with the artist team and the collective, we work together. It's not us saying, this is your rehearsal time. This is what we do. We work together to bring the project together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my next question is going to be put out to the ladies of the Solo Sirens Collective, uh, Pauline, Nelta, Melody, and Aoife, who are with us, um, to, speak, to just, if you wouldn't mind, speaking a little bit about how you began that process of working together. All of you had relationships and ties to the Civic Theatre, to Jenny and to Jen. Um, but when you come together and start working towards a festival, towards this piece, um, it, it, you know, it changes a little bit. Um, do you want to speak to that process of coming together and beginning to put falling into place? Well, for me, it was, <laughs> it's funny because initially I just thought, ah, sure, you know, oh, we'll find out what's, what it is about. Because the beauty of, of Jenny, you know, is she never explained. She gave us like the rough idea and we kind of got it but she didn't really give us the, so this is what's going to happen. So it was like, oh, today we're going to do this. So we did that, that first day, it was like, okay, you didn't suck, so I'll come back next time. And then, <laughs> and then next time it went back. And then um, I met, I think I paired with Aoife, probably first day or second time, I can't remember. And then we, we were telling each other stories. And I told Aoife my story, I, I don't remember, I think it was my miscarriage story. And uh, Aoife told me her story about her grandmother, I think. And somehow I just felt like I knew Aoife, like I've known Aoife my whole life, even though I didn't. But that story, the way she told it was so open, was so honest, which for me was very new because living in Ireland 20 years, I find talking to Irish women really difficult because you guys don't really open up, like you don't show yourselves. And are you? And even if you dig, sometimes you hit a rock and that's it. So this was the first time I really felt like someone was just being themselves, being honest. And I loved that. That's, what, that's when I really committed, okay, I'm doing this. And that just during that conversation. And yeah, it was really awesome. Thank you. Uh, Pauline, Nelta, Aoife, would you like to speak to uh, maybe the middle stages or the later stages of the process and, and how that came together? Um, so uh, what happened to me was um, Tony Fagan had um, heard I was having a couple of changes in my life and things going on. <laughs> and he said, I need to put you in contact with somebody. And then lovely Jenny sent me an email saying there was going to be a performance in the Abbey. I knew nothing about what anything. <laughs> so she said, you have to come and see us in the Abbey. And I did. And I remember the first year, I remember walking in, knew nobody, <laughs> uh, sitting down, watching. And I was just completely overwhelmed by the whole thing that I was watching. It was completely different to anything I would have ever seen or been involved in. I was used to being handed a script, being handed a score. This is where you stand. This is what you do. Da, 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 da. So when I was watching, I just, I mean, you use the word melody um, empowering. And that's, I felt empowered that day. And afterwards, Jenny said to me, so is it something you think you'd like to be involved in? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I really think I do. But I have to say, with some trepidation, I went to the first Tuesday night. I had met nobody, knew nobody. 
walked in. I'd go, oh God, what am I doing here? Am I mad? And literally bounced out that night because I just felt this is me. This is where I need to be. I felt so welcomed by everybody. And it really felt like an extended family. Like immediately, I just felt I had such connections. And obviously through Jenny's facilitating, I was sharing things that I had never shared before with people and things were just flowing and it just went from there and again like Melody initially I was like I don't really know what this is <laughs> and when I went home like for the first week or two people say like my family were saying so what's that you're doing where's your script where's and I'm kind of going um kind of and I was trying to explain and I'm sure they were going oh, mommy has <laughs> lost it mommy's really lost it here but it was incredible. And as it moved on, I just moved with it. We all moved together, all of us women. I felt it was just a movement of, of us, you know, moving along and just loving what we were doing. And yeah, just, yeah, loved it and want more. <laughs> Thank you. More. And we will more questions for the collective but uh just bouncing off of what pauline said about coming in as someone who maybe yeah. wasn't part of that first group that was in the abbey uh, i'd like to move over to our solo performers who had developed their pieces and they came into the festival into this collective um and i want to first take it to nicole whose uh solo piece was called baggage uh because i think she has a really uh interesting experience to tell that is very, very enlightening about this process and how it's supportive uh, and how this model was a little bit different from maybe some other festivals. Nicole, would you mind sharing that? No, not at all. Um, just, just to say, I think probably some of you know, I'm quite, um, uh, I, I'm, I wear hearing aids, so I've had to, do, to sacrifice them to put these in. So just uh you know can you hear me okay and uh, yeah so it's a little bit challenging but i'm going to be looking very closely so i can read your lips as well okay um and interesting enough baggage was actually the first play i did while wearing hearing aids so that was a that was the situation um so yeah i mean one of the biggest things, and I had to talk to Jenny about this, was um, I'd already been, and it was such a delight to be in, uh, invited to be part of it and to be commissioned by Solo Sirens. Um, and I had talked to Jenny about this because I, uh, and I just decided to be really kind of upfront about it in terms of what was going on for me at the time. And uh, very influenced by what you just said their melody as well about how in Ireland and you're bang on a lot of the time we keep things very much inside and part of my play was about that because it deals with that small town and what happens when you don't follow the path that's out uh, and, and that things don't work out so while I was working on this piece, uh, I actually uh, separated from a long-term relationship and um, a very, very close friend died and uh, I lost my home in the space of about five days. So, uh, yeah, uh, while writing a play called Baggage, so uh, love irony, if nothing else. Um, so basically at that time uh, I, I was very close to pulling out of the festival um, which I would never do. I would like to think I'm a consummate prof uh, professional. I've been doing this for years but uh, I just thought I don't know how I can actually pull this off. Um, but it was just the level of support and me and Jenny have talked about this um, just that all happened for me in August and so I, I but by the time the baggage went on stage uh, I still didn't really have anywhere to live I was staying with people and um, so it was pretty much a just a situation of where a lot of things in my life were very very um, 
difficult as you can imagine. Um, and actually being on stage turned out to be the easiest thing. Um, but I remember inviting Jenny around on the, I think it was the 9th of November, Jenny, to the place I was staying at the time. And um, I, I just was saying to her, I, I don't know if I've got anything. And I've been working obviously with Deirdre Malloy, who was just incredibly supportive to me and um, again I just didn't know I didn't feel I had the script even at that stage and um, and Jenny just I remember lay on the sofa and I read what I had and, uh, which I was all over the gap to be quite honest and Jenny just she just started cracking up and she just lay there with her eyes closed on the sofa uh, listening um, and just and she just looked at me and she said she she looked right at me like she looked looking into me the way Jenny does and she said uh, I, I think you've got something and we went through as Jen knows as well we went through lots of different possibilities of how I could do this but the the idea was that I'd walk on stage holding the script because I thought there's no way I can actually even get this in my head once it's written but, you know, um, I actually hit the stage on the 29th uh, of November, 20 days after. And this isn't me going, oh, wow, amazing. If I knew how I could do it, how I did it, I don't know how I did it. If I knew I did, I'd be doing it all the time, do you know. Um, but I think working on the script became like a bit of a mantra where I would just say it and it was, it was actually the easiest place to go when things in your life have all gone, you know. So my pandemic started in 2019, guys, <laughs> we got this. Um, so, you know, at that point I was just like, do the darn thing and it hit the stage and the level of support from Zolo Siren, because again, both Jenny and Jen worked, like they really supported me, we chatted it out and um, the only people kind of in that circle were Deirdre, Jenny, uh, and Jen, myself, that kind of knew what was going on. Um, and they, there was also the option of you can walk away at any time um, because your life is more important. And again, we talked about the idea. I, and I'm not saying women over men, but I do know I've heard so many stories of women, and I've done it myself, about 20 years ago on the show, I've gone on stage after hearing the worst of news. And it's like, we, it's a badge of honor to get out there and just go on stage and do whatever, do whatever your job is, whatever it might be, when you are in the, in the harshest and in the roughest of times. And sometimes as Jenny, I remember you saying both you and Jen and Deirdre, you were all like, your life and your mental health is more important than the, the goddamn play, you know? Uh, and the whole point of Solo Sirens is to hold the space for people as you hold the space. And I remember just that feeling of actually, as I said, being on stage, being with me baggage, Dragging around Romy baggage was the most actually, um, it was like being at home for somebody who didn't have one at the time. Um, and I remember actually Kira came into a rehearsal and, uh, and she was so amazing because I'd written her into the play and I thought I haven't even met her and I've written her in, I don't know how this go. Um, but uh, she kind of, you laughed your ass off Kira, and I was like, wow. Okay, and <laughs> even when the the show hit the stage and we, uh, you know, it was um, I I hadn't actually realised that it was actually quite funny, um, mm -hmm. because I think um, yeah, just many things, but it was such a delight and the backstage crew, everything, Much. everybody, I felt held the space for me and uh, and that allowed me to fly so. Thank you. you can hear me okay, are you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So much for sharing that story with us and for really highlighting that ethos of your life is more important. I can't hear you guys, sorry. Uh, 
uh, that ethos that your life is more important than the show. Uh, we have about six minutes left and we have so many more panelists uh, that I would like to, to chat with. But first, I want to throw it over to Jacinta, who was the solo performer in Sweet About You. Uh, and I know that you've participated in other theater festivals. You've performed around Dublin and Ireland. Um, can you speak to how so was was different? Um, I suppose what everyone, first of all, I just want to say how amazing this has been this morning because I didn't expect this, but I've been emotional for from the start where Jenny read the piece. I was like, so Joe Salvador said, I was just emotional um, and just everything that's happened. So all the stories has been just, it's been emotional and it's only the start. Um, so... I guess what Jenny had said this morning about care and taking your time, that's, that's what I loved about the Solo Sirens Festival. And I also loved the, the community engagement piece. Uh, I remember the first day walking into the Abbey with the collective uh, for the rehearsal and just feeling the warmth and love from everyone who I think they just met twice at that point when I met them that first day and we had lunch together and we were sharing stories and it was just and that's why I say celebration for me word because it just felt like just such a a community and a celebration and I felt that I was cared for a lot um by Jenny and Jen and I've worked with them a good bit at this stage and I just love them and again I'm emotional <laughs> um but they're just great women and they empower other women and that's just such a brilliant quality um, and to be minded and like what Nicole said to have somebody bring you in and commission you and look after you and yeah it was just lovely it was just a lovely experience and I think what you were saying earlier Jenny about the uh, the mental health the first fortnight mm. I think you managed to do what they done to you oh, you sure. managed to hold us like you were held yeah wow. oh, I'm so glad to hear that <laughs> Jacinta yeah and what a great compliment Jenny um I want to now throw it over to Kira, who was the female technician for the Solo Sirens Festival, but uh, it was a challenge to find her that both Jen and Jenny lived up to. Uh, but Kira, if you wouldn't mind speaking to your experience with Solo Sirens and maybe how it, it might be different from your work uh, outside of the festival as a, a female technician. Yeah. Um... So Solo, Sire Solo Sirens was like just an amazing journey for me. Like it was completely different to anything I'd ever done previously. And the fact that it was a female led festival was just incredible. And like me being part of the festival was different um, in many ways. And as well, the fact that I was the outsider and I was just brought in to do a specific job, like being the festival technician. And I'm not going to lie, I was really nervous about taking on such a big job because I'd only just graduated from college and this was a big deal. But from my first meeting with Jen and Michelle to then meeting Martha and Jenny, I never once felt like I was an outsider. Like I was welcome with open arms and I felt like I knew everyone from the beginning. And the more people that I met, the more I learned about everyone's incredible life journeys, well, like, which was then brought to life on stage. And it was just so raw and powerful. And it was just like so beautiful and so inclusive. Like my job was to run the technical aspect of the shows from lights and sound and operate the show, which I did for three out of the, three out of the four shows. And one of the things I loved about working on the shows was that ego was just never part of it. Mm -hmm. I guess we were all there to do a job and we wanted to put on an amazing collection of performances, which both looked and sounded spectacular. But everyone's ideas and opinions were listened to and respected. Like I've been on jobs where I've been looked down on because of my age and my gender. And with Solo Sirens, I always felt valued. And like being a female technician will always uh, come with its challenges. But with festivals like Solo Sirens, we are changing people's perspectives on what we can do and what we can achieve. And I am forever grateful to Solo Sirens and the memories that I have will just be cherished forever. So thank you so much to everyone. Just thank you. Wow, Kira, thank you so much. That was, gave me goosebumps actually. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that you had that uh, empowering experience. Uh, I think we can all relate to, to being shut down in some other spaces and, and maybe not listened to. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have about one minute left, but maybe we might get a few quick responses. Uh, just wanted to think about, now that you've experienced the festival, you've had some time to think about it, what do you think this model afforded for the participating 
artists? Any, anyone on the panel? I know Jenny, you had shared a few antidotes when we were speaking earlier last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just give a moment though, in case if, if somebody who was, yeah, who was uh, an artist does want to come in. Yeah, I mean, I was an artist, but I had a more, <laughs> I had an overview. <laughs> yeah. Okay, for me, it was more like being allowed to share space with other women, uh, talking about experiences that were not necessarily, it did happen in Ireland, but had resonance with a lot of the people that were in the group I was in falling. And uh, like what everyone else said there, we, we walked in and we became a family and that's been like that since day one. Even when Pauline stepped in, it didn't feel like she had it been there from the start. So the, the ability to create a space where everyone felt comfortable to share and even to learn, uh, we, we had people from all over the place, but we all learned that we were from Tala. So Tala was like the home that we all embraced. And so it was just sharing the other journeys that we had away from each other and the experiences and even the fact that like, because it became falling, it was talking about how we allow each other to fall, be there for each other while we're falling and then help raise you up when you're ready to rise. And that is something I always try to remember now when I'm, when I'm around people who are struggling. So the experience of that was amazing and I, I hope to have so many more like that. Thank you, Nelta. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for maybe one more response from the panel to this. I think um, if I can jump in there, I think uh, one really transformative part of the experience was that experience of hearing other stories and of sharing your own, having your story listened to and valued in the way it was, there was something, it, it felt as well like a journey of self-discovery, the, the seeing reflections of your story and other stories and suddenly seeing the thread that, that you know, we didn't try to construct the thread, it just emerged through, through um, the, the play that we did together really. Um, so there was there was something very transformative about that and I feel I actually got to know myself better by getting to know the women in the collective. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, and thank you to the ladies on this panel. We will be hearing more from you, but the time has come to uh, pass the torch over to our next moderator, Kate Harris, who is going to introduce us to some of the audience members who were present. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> thank you so much, Courtney. And thank you to all the performers from Solo Sirens. Um, I was really struck um, by how this model that's been created with Solo Sirens really uh, promotes this way. I think Nelson said it in the audience feedback that women have these conversations, not, you know, not in a linear fashion, but, you know, A to T and Q to S and then Q back to A again. And I just think it's, um, you know, it, it's so amazing to hear all the voices and see how those conversations developed into performances and collaborations and really, um, you know, let us into this, you know, this incredible way of, of working and, and of being, um, you know, really thoughtful, mindful um, and taking care. Um, so this model also brought in the audience to these ongoing conversations um, across four incredibly diverse performances. And I would, I, my name is Kate Harris, again, uh, as Courtney said, um, and I'm a theater maker and inclusive practitioner. And I'd like to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves uh, now. We've got four audience members joining us today. And maybe Ashley, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Ashley. Um, I'm a second year journalism student in the Technological University of Dublin. And I am a writer and I'm the co-founder of the Galpal Collective. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Vlad? 
Um, I'm Vlad. I'm a theatre maker based in Tala, and I'm co-director of Freshly Ground Theatre. Um, Great, thanks, Vlad. And Alita. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alita. Uh, I am a teacher. Um, I also part of a feminist collective uh, of Latin American women or Spanish-speaking women in Ireland for the last two years. Excellent. And Phil? Hi, I'm Phil. I'm a facilitator, a producer and an arts manager. Um, my day job is as community and education manager of the Abbey Theatre. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and I just want to start, what, what was your experience um, as audience members in the Solar Sirens Festival um, to be part of this conversation um, across the, the four performances that were part of the festival? Does anyone want to jump in? Or Ashley, we could start with you. Okay. Um, it was... Solo Sirens kind of felt like something, it was the thing I never knew that I needed. Um, I guess it's like subconsciously you're so aware that theatre is such a male dominated space. So to come into one that is like fully female ran was so refreshing. It felt like there was parts of myself that I didn't have to be, have to constantly explain. And it felt like I was truly being seen in the art that I was watching. So it was an experience that um, I just want more of it. I just love to see myself and to see all of the other women that were in the audience be represented like that. So it was super empowering. Thank you, Ashley. That's great. Um, Vlad, what, what was your experience? I know Ashley has just said that she, she felt like this was a space she could walk into and really be seen and understood. Um, now, looking through the lens of gender, this was a, a female-led uh, show. What was your perform or your experience um, being male in that space? Um, I mean, to begin with, I think it was, it was, they were a collection of stories and, you know, and the stories kind of, to me, as I seen them every two weeks, they did form, uh, they, they were about different things they were kind of about the individual experiences of the people performing them but at the same time they also kind of contributed to a whole conversation to me that um i was kind of looking into i had to listen into myself i had to kind of it, it was nice because it was something i could relate to and could not relate to it on certain levels and it was kind of a growing experience for me um and i really kind of would want to uh re-emphasize like some of the things that were said previously and i could really i really would commend the kind of the whole program's philosophy of care that went through i think it was like really clear in the way everything was done that they committed to that philosophy um which i think sometimes is a given like it's treated as a given in uh, outside of this space. Uh, it's that, oh, we will take care of each other. And that's never really spoken of, but that was a true philosophy that everyone committed to. And I think it came true in the sense of there is, I think Kira mentioned there's a la uh, lack of ego uh, that was like not, it was like in performing what they were doing. And uh, even though there would be like one woman shows or there'd be, you know, the ensembles, I noticed it was a very subtle distinction, but it was kind of a sharing of stories rather than anyone's, their own moment. And I think that kind of um, brought about a very unique quality to what everyone was doing. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'll, I'll throw this out here, just, you know, thinking about the experience of the audience. What, what was the experience of seeing multiple shows over the period of six weeks? Did that, did that impact on your kind of understanding of you know, the individual works or you know, did you have a greater understanding of, of, kind of with the collective pieces? How did, how did, how did that, uh, those, those pieces interact for you? Um, again, I think, because they were all kind of dealing with their own themes but at the same time, I think they fed into one another as I saw them week to week. Um, yeah, and I could kind of 
there's universalities in them between them that I were new to me, hmm. you know, and I could point out like, you know, themes in each one that, you know, everyone's experience kind of was kind of universal in some aspects that were foreign to me, you know, okay. as kind of being, I guess, man uh, or a self-identifying man. And um, again, that was just a really interesting thing to me. And it's something, I think, a quote that I couldn't get out of my head. Jenny said it to me a couple of weeks ago. And I think Joe said it to her. And it's this thing about coming to a show and you're either looking at the shows, you're looking at the show through a mirror and you might be seeing yourself or you might be seeing the show through a window. You might be mm -hmm. hearing it through a window. And um, it was kind of a very interesting experience of both for me. There was maybe talk of trauma. There was talk of um, many kind of themes. And I could relate to some of them, but how the angle of how those uh, themes affected the people that they were talking about were different to me. Okay. And it kind of, again, the conversation that uh, the, this whole conversation or discussion that those pieces fed into were really informative to me. I think it was very valuable to me as an audience member and as, again, self-identifying man to experience them. Great. And Alita, I, I just want to throw over to you there um, because I know you're, you're part of a feminist collective. Um, what's, your, what's your take on, um, on the solo sirens as an audience member? Um, um, well, uh, well, well, Lat's idea of this window mirror uh, uh, kind of line that has also been in my in my head a lot. I think it's a very telling of uh, um, an audience experience in any kind of show. But if this one in particular, I think it was even stronger because there was an open conversation done by the whole users of the festival and. Uh, I've known Jenny for many years now, and I saw Enthroned before within the context of the um, first Fortnite festival. And I could totally get some of what she recreated for the Solo Sirens, this idea of a feedback loop, a conversation with, with the audience, where at the end of each play, you would be encouraged to uh, share your opinions, to uh, write in a piece of paper, uh, to have those chats that uh, the play will bring about. Uh, so, um, I think I liked a lot uh, Melody's words in the previous panel. She said empowerment. And I think hearing those ideas or those yeah, conversations, seeing them in a play, it's a very empowering feeling for the audience as well. Like seeing how somebody has a story, it's also your story. Especially in the collectives, the Soul Sirens, as someone who was not born here in Ireland as well, bringing that story into your own story. And like you said, Kate, I'm part of this collective, this uh, women's group that's been meeting up once a month for the last maybe two years or so. And that place of uh, non-judgment, of listening to each other, that conversation that flows in a natural way, is a big part of that. Um, if, it's an it's an activist it's a, it's, yeah it's an activist uh, group, but yet a lot of the talks are in more in a place of um, uh, it's sort of like group uh, therapy session more than anything. Uh, so I hope you can still hear me. Okay, I think my headphones might just change or whatever. Uh, so. I think I felt very much identified with many of the pieces and the ones that I didn't also gave me a lot of food for thought. So I think as an audience, it was really uh, a beautiful journey of seeing different stories and then many stories into one. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it was lovely. And I, and I think this event is also continuing and building up on that conversation. So uh, I think uh, it's, uh, yeah empowering, an empowering journey, I would say. Thanks, Alita. Yeah, and this, again, the, the model of the symposium follows up on, you know, these, these models of engagement. Um, Phil, 
what was your experience of the festival over over the six weeks and you know and then maybe even with the engagement um afterwards well um i want to pick up on this metaphor of the window and the mirror which uh, which people have been talking about and uh i mean one of the big characteristics of this festival was the encouragement for us to reflect the talkbacks afterwards and everything else and also i've gone back to some of the pieces um, knowing that this uh, symposium was happening and had to think again and I can I can give you some pretty straight answers and candid answers and we were encouraged to be quite personal so I will be about um, what window what were windows and what was mirrors and and for me uh, a festival which announces itself as being a sort of you know a, a female based um, uh, festival it's a chance for me to get a window into that permanently undiscovered country which is female experience and which I'm you know constantly interested in finding out about and I'll give you an example of that. Um, my friends and my partners and, and you know, my female friends will tell me what it's like, what women's experience is like, and I'll think I'll understand. And then I'll hear a story and I'll really say, oh, that's what it's actually like to be always scared to go out on your own at night. Or that's what it's actually like to work in an industry where you're constantly disempowered. So for example, this happened a lot around waking the feminists when people shared stories of what it was like to work in the theater industry. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, these people I've been working with, that's what their actual experience is like. So it was a wonderful, you know, it was a, a, as, as a window into, into stories which would help me deeper, more deeply understand these things I thought I already knew. But it was also a mirror in some ways as well. So for example, I'm a recovering addict. So um, uh, a Jacinta's piece had resonances for me about addiction, different, different types of addiction, but I could see some mirrors in that. But also there's something else that was quite striking, which is I, I got a quote when I was looking through the audience reactions. Until we expose the shadow, we cannot get to be fully women. Nadia said that about one of the pieces. And actually, I thought I saw some men's shadow really quite clearly in these pieces. And I, I, I felt it. I remember saying to Jenny after Enthroned, the, the Black Prince, this coercive relationship she has, um, really struck me. And on one level, it's to do with thinking, okay, look, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be straight. I realize that most of the time, if I'm watching a specifically um, a piece of theater or art that's specifically a woman's point of view and a man is in it, I'm checking to see how the man behaves as kind of notes. Like I've got a permanent notebook of going, women don't like that, they do like that. Yeah, And I must have been doing that since I was like 15, 16 years old. I realize it's almost a habit of mine, yeah? Oh, right, right. But on a deeper level, um, what I'm going is I'm working out how to behave like I do with most stories actually I'm there's a little bit of me just working out how to behave and the black prince really struck me because I thought oh my god am I also being glibly assertive in a way that's disempowering to people and that that, that one struck me and also just a, one more in Jacinta's piece um, Rubin's Rubin's bluntness but also wisdom struck me as well and I thought that's interesting that's how he comes across um, so yeah, there was a lot. I mean, I just chosen those to share with you, but there was a lot that I saw mirrored and there was some windows into stuff I really didn't understand before I saw them through them. Thank you so much, Phil, for sharing that. Yeah, it's um, that, that, that analogy of the, the window and the mirror is, I think it, it really, I, I really feel this like through these conversations that we're having as well, um, you know, in our experience as audience members, what we what we see of ourselves and then what is absolutely new to us um, in this. Because of course this is diverse not just in gender, but in terms of community. Um, and I I, I wanna I wanna go back to you now, um, to everyone. Is it what what also is the experience of being invited in as audience members into a, a wider community and today part of wider communities um, in the symposium. What did that, did that affect your, I don't know, your experience or understanding of the performances being um, invited to continue the conversation through the post-show discussions and, and through as Ali, uh, Ali mentioned, the 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 uh, box pops and the the um, you know being asked for your feedback on the shows in other ways. Um, so we'll just maybe go around to everyone um, again and just um, share that that experience of being invited in 
um, in a way that audiences generally aren't for most theater performances. Um, I guess for me, one of the great things about these post-show discussions is that the beauty of theatre is that you're not forced to focus on a specific thing on stage. Like with film, with TV, the camera will focus on a specific thing that they want you to look at. But when you go to theatre, your brain kind of wanders as it chooses. So it's so interesting to see what different things people picked up as they were watching the show. Because my brain was somewhere else and so you come together and even though the message of the piece was the same you kind of ultimately saw different plays because you all saw different things and so it's been so nice to getting to hear what people picked up from all of the plays and be like oh my god I saw this thing did you see that no I didn't see that but I saw this instead I think it adds to my understanding of the play and like the depth of it like, for example, I never really thought about how men were portrayed in any of the pieces, because for me, it was about the women. So it's interesting to see in the male perspective that men were specifically aware of how they themselves show up in women's stories, because it's just my brain would have filtered that out. So that's something that I really enjoy about these discussions that you get to, you learn more about yourself and what you pay attention to. Um, I think I will, yeah, I kind of agree with what Ashley said. I think it, it gives the performances um, extra lives. It gives them more life um, because to see someone else's point of view, what they took out of that piece, you kind of learn how to reframe that piece through their lens, how they saw it through their life experiences, through their kind of mental prism. And you kind of go back and yeah, you do kind of go, God, I want to see that piece again because I was looking for these things. They were relevant to me and they touched me there. But, you know, I, I, yeah, I wasn't examining how men were actually portrayed in each of these pieces and how their role was there. So I, I kind of want to give them another look. So it becomes an extra, it's like, uh, it becomes like a 4D theater in a sense because you want to, it's a thing that happens, you know, live, it can, you, your version of it can only happen to you. And then you see it through someone else's point of view. You want to see it through their point of view. It just, it turns, it's just really complex, but beautiful thing. Um, so that's, yeah, I think there's a beauty to uh, seeing other people's perspectives to it because it gives it more dimensions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the fact that, uh, on the, like seeing several shows on the first where you're presented with this idea of okay so you can write on uh, your uh, feedback or you can make a short video there's a panel discussions the conversation opens up there so then because uh, I ended up watching three of the shows and then on the next one you're kind of like anticipating a bit and really going while you're watching the place it's like okay what have not seen here and then it's all fresh in your mind and you get the chance of saying oh okay so I like this i like that and open up that conversation i think it kind of uh makes the message of all the plays maybe a little bit stronger that's something that like you were saying Kate, like theater does not always allow for that conversation to to happen uh and in a way it kind of brings you in to, to the story and not so much of an outsider. Uh, it's like you can share a little bit of, the, uh, of that experience, let's say. So I, uh, I thought it was a great concept. <laughs> That's great. I, mean, I, love, I love the way you say it, like, you know, being brought, being brought inside the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, having listened to the performers today, you know, it really feels like we're given permission as audience members to, you know, see the inner workings. And I, I just want to go back to that idea of, um, I think Ashley and Vlad both, both said this, the idea of how the post-show discussion and then, you know, the feedback and, um, you know, the conversations just in the foyer after the shows really pulled your focus in different directions and made you notice things, um, either about your own attention or, you know, maybe things that you hadn't thought about, you know, um, so, yeah, Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about that? You, you, you mentioned that um, a little earlier, and I'm just wondering if you want to expand on that. 
Well, I'd suggest that the, um, I agree with everything that's just been said. And I think we can look at it also from a political dimension as well, because it's kind of anti-consumerist doing it this way. We do live in a, in a patriarchy in a society which encourages just to consume art. Um, you just watch the film, see the theatre. If you're lucky, you might go with some friends and talk about it. But sometimes you just you eat it and it's gone sort of thing. And what Solo Sirens Festival did was it really made us reflect. It made us reflect. And as uh, Elisa said, um, you know, when you start coming to the later ones, you start having to think about, well, what will I say afterwards? And that's a much more active engagement um, with, um, uh, with art and then a much more active engagement with each other. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a question behind this whole symposium, which is, is there a female aesthetic, which is different from a male aesthetic, for example? Well, I think that's going to come up in the paper later. And I'd say this is a dimension of it. How do you engage with art? Uh, is, there a, is there a more female way of engaging with art uh, as opposed to simply consuming it and passing on? So, yeah, I, I really appreciated that aspect of it. And it's, uh, it's made me think, I mean, just preparing for this, I've had to do some thinking. I've had to do some reflecting and articulating and working out what I was going to say. And that's a much more fruitful and, um, you know, that's a, a life of creativity if you live like that, as opposed to just sort of eating it and passing on. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, it's, it's very much, and uh, thanks for saying that, Phil, about, uh, I know I've, I've read Claire's paper and we're going to hear from her later, uh, but bringing in those different strands of engagement, you know, um, not just consuming theater, you know. Uh, I think, you know, particularly now um, when there's so many restrictions, you know, there's so many, uh, you know, there's a lot of difficulty about making art and engaging with it. I think it's a really great time to ask what what's it for, you know, what is what is theater for, and just bringing in different ways of engaging, so not just consuming, having those you know opportunities to think deeply about the framing, you know, the question of what do I see, what does this make me think, how am I engaging with my community, and you know what are the different ways of engaging, and so. Just in the last few minutes that we have, um, can I go back around to everyone and just say what what did you, I guess, understand from being a part of the audience and solo sirens that maybe you didn't understand before? Um, and what would you like to see more of? I'm going to start with Ashley there. Um. I think the thing that I appreciated the most out of Solo Sirens was seeing women as just being. We tend to, in art, women, like, for example, one thing that I loved was that we got to see women angry. We never get to see women angry in art. And it's such an odd thing, but it was so refreshing to get to see that because we never get the space to kind of just show our emotions as emotions without being called bitchy or aggressive or assertive. So... I think moving forward, that's the thing that I'm definitely going to be looking for when I consume art, when I consume theatre. I want to see women as being, like they, they get to have thoughts and opinions and feelings about whatever they're going through and it shouldn't be diluted to make others feel more comfortable. That's, yeah, that, that's so really just in terms of how women are represented and how we're allowed to be in spaces um, and that this was a space that we could as women be and um, what what would you take into the like what would you like to see more of from this you know having experienced this what what would you like to see more of i guess just more of women being allowed to create that they want to create I think that's kind of it. I just, for, yeah, just for more opportunities for women to be able to create their stories without, I guess, the male gaze playing a part into the story that they're creating. Because ultimately it's not for men, they cre we create for ourselves. So that's kind of what I want to see. I want to see more solo sirens, basically. <laughs> Definitely. Um... Vlad, I, I might just ask, can I ask Vlad, maybe yourself and Alita and Phil, um, just 
kind of respond out. I'm having a little trouble with the sound, so um, I might just let you guys um, have the have the final couple of minutes. So maybe maybe just a short response from from each of you in the last minute or two that we have here. Thank you so much. Um, I think I think we need more of this, um, and I kind of do agree that it's a very unique experience to have this showcase of work that is kind of, um, for lack of a better term, untainted by kind of the male presence or influence. Because it's quite, you know, it, it, it is a unique experience in the sense that things like this happen where it's very male centric and it's all kind of more or less dominated by males without even trying. It, it's not an event right now. That shouldn't be the case. You know, that is kind of in some sense the norm. You can walk out and stumble about an event like that that's real male centric and you know and it's like i think the, like events like this should normalize this kind of a, kind of an experience i think um because they do portray new perspectives and they're all about learning and understanding each other and respecting each other's life experiences uh in the way to kind of make each other's lives better in some sense and how we treat each other Yeah, I was going to follow up on that one. Uh, for me, I would like to see more spaces of open discussion. Uh, like, um, it, it was very interesting to, to hear uh, Vlad and Phil's perspective on the things. And again, like Ashley was saying, like, there's some things that I wasn't even thinking about uh, with the play from the film perspective was so embedded in the story that they did not think, oh, how will men see this or how do, will they make them uh, feel but it's so important to have this empower women telling their stories but not just to a female audience because if we are going to empower both genders to bring out their female side of themselves then the males need to hear all the stories and need to be able to see what is relatable to them because uh, they will find moments as like oh i have felt this way before but maybe i have no one to share it with or to talk uh, about it with so it's always been from the outside and if we can bring in uh the the male part in the conversation find that lovely balance of seeing angry women but seeing uh you know uh sensitive men together i think that's that's when we're making real progress. Uh, if, as, if we can share all of this um, non-hierarchical conversation that we as women can have as a group and bring it over to a mixed group, let's say. So I would like to see more of that, for sure. Um, um Building on that a bit, I think one of the things I'm left with is a curiosity about um, the female aesthetic and questioning some of the basic forms of narrative, how we tell stories, the hero's quest, all this sort of stuff, and realizing that that is, uh, that enshrines certain values and qualities in, in what we accept as the sort of art that we consume. As Ashley said earlier, I mean, the dominance of male pl um, playwrights, for example, in the Irish canon uh, is, is really striking, yeah? And wondering about going back and refining different types of stories which contain which more of a, f a female aesthetic and, and trying to open myself up to more of a female aesthetic and look at the very structure uh, and shape and pattern in which stories are told and question those. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you all so much to our audience respondents. Uh, as promised an hour ago, we have gotten to the Q&A portion uh, for the, the last two panels. So everyone will stay on and now we will open up to audience questions. Um, so please, like I said, feel free to write in on the Q&A. If you'd like to ask your question live, we absolutely encourage that. We would love to hear your question asked in your own voice. Uh, so just type into the Q&A live and we will make sure 
to, to highlight you and bring you forward. Um, luckily, we do already have a question that has been sitting in the wings for a while. Um, and this goes back, it, it seems like this is something that everyone's kind of looking forward to. Uh, that mentorship talk, uh, we, it was kind of uh, teased a little bit earlier in the conversation with Joe and, and Jenny. Uh, and Joe said something really lovely about, you know, you just, you never know when you're going to have an impact and, and that mentorship, it can be a fleeting thing that you realize afterwards. So I, I do encourage uh, everyone on the panel, if, if you have a response to this question, to please feel free uh, to respond. Uh, Carmen Myers from New York wrote in, uh, I appreciate the diversity of age in your work. Uh, and mentorship is usually viewed as an older mentoring younger. Um, and was there a conscious choice to redefine mentorship for women uh, and solo work for all ages? So um, any of the participants, I think, uh, of Solo Sirens, if, if you have a response or, or a feeling about this, whether you felt like a mentor or you felt menteed. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that, um, the age difference. And I think something that was lovely was that there were official mentors, or sorry, mentees, um, Michelle Henry and Martha Knight, and we're going to hear a video of them in conversation later. But something that was so wonderful for me was to find myself really leaning heavily on and relying on um, Michelle and Martha because they had been my students. I've known them, I think, since they were about 15 and it's fascinating that transition from student to um, kind of like friend, collaborator, and then definitely on this festival, moments where I was just like, I don't know what to do, help, you know, and I would be, I would be turning to them. And, you know, on paper, I'm their mentor, but that was, again, like I go back to the infinity symbol, it was absolutely a two-way relationship. And there were so many moments, um, I, like I remember standing backstage with Martha before Enthroned, and she was like, you got this you got this you know she really gave me this like that that boost to go out and I thought oh I love that because um you know I remember doing that with her when she was like 10 years ago uh, going out on stage as well so um I think it's yeah sometimes this I think we, we talked about like trying to lessen all these different separations that we live under and, and false separations and age is definitely one of those you know mm -hmm. so, so such a false division yeah. It reminds me, it's very like a Frarian sort of pedago pedagogy that we acknowledge that everyone is an expert in their own story. And so yes. we have something to learn. And I love that you brought it back to that infinity symbol, Jenny, because um, it seems like there's a lot of that flow mm -hmm. uh, throughout the festival. Um, Jessica Carlton uh, is curious to know what was the number count of audience members and the breakdown, if anyone has that data, might give it a moment um, to see if anyone may have that data about the, the count of the audience uh, as well as the gender breakdown. Um, I think Jen Webster, do you? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm trying to work my brain here. I'd say on average per show, um, we had about between 100 and 120 people see each show over two nights. We were in a small studio in the Civic Theatre. Um, regarding the gender breakdown, again, this is very, very approximate, but I would say 60, 40 um, women, 60%, men, 40%. There was a lot of men in the audiences. I, I, I wouldn't have said it, it was absent. So I, I would say 60, 40. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and Jessica also had another question, uh, wanting to know about how the event uh, was marketed and how it was presented and targeted. Okay. So there was a number of ways through which we did that. I mean, so Solar Sirens Festival, it was produced by myself, but through Tala Community Arts. So we had the Tala Community Arts Organization promoting for us. We also had the Civic Theatre as well. Um, and we reached out to press. We had Martha is our social media ninja. So she was blasting social media. And um, we also actually, you know, went and visited so many community groups in South Dublin County. You know, I, I, we had um, a choir for over 65s um, that I went to visit and I was explaining to them about the shows and they were like, <laughs> they turned up at the Civic and said, 
I want to see the show where the woman's had enough, the one about the rage. <laughs> That's what they, so literally, we, we went out to visit people to talk to them about Fellas Irons and tell them about it. So definitely the usual posters, press and all that, but definitely face-to-face contact with people as well. It seems like the, the relationship aspect is a really huge theme. Absolutely. Really big takeaway from what, what, the way that you worked. Wow. Um, while we wait on uh, more questions to come in, I have a question actually uh, for the whole panel, but though it was a little bit inspired by uh, my colleague Kate uh, and her panel with the audiences. Um, what do you think you will carry with you from this experience into the future? Anyone on the panel? Uh, for me, what I'll carry is uh, the knowledge that there's a lot that, that I don't know, that I haven't done, and that's probably when it pops up, it's scary, uh, but there are people there willing and able to support, and there have been so many things that I've reached out to, say, Jen and Jenny for, that if inspired me to kind of think more of, okay, maybe I could do more in the arts. And I'm also exploring my, my own personal journey in there. But uh, this created a space where I could identify some things that I'd say, hmm, it makes sense why, well, on a personal level for me, I could never say, or say, oh, so what's your job description? I could never say one thing because I love doing many things. And it comes back to uh, the fact that in my culture, a person is never one thing. It's a Western anomaly whereby, let's say you say I'm a teacher, but you're a mother, a sister, a, a, a farmer, a cook, a cleaner, or whatever. So this opens up a space where even storytelling should have that many dimensions and tell stories in, in, in that depth and that way because human beings are not just one thing. There are so many things just industrialization took away that uh, the, the bigness of individuals. And then if you put them all together, it creates an amazing thing. So that's my takeaway. Oh, thank you, Nelta. And, and Melody, did you have a response as well? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, my takeaway would be that connection is possible at any level, at any time. And uh, we spoke about mentorship. I think I was the oldest person in the falling group and um, and I uh, before Pauline came in and and I um, despite that I felt like I was the one who was learning a lot from the young people I was the one who was getting a lot from them and 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 also knowing that it's possible to connect with anyone at any time and just because it's not successful sometimes that doesn't mean that it's not successful all the time. And, and for me, especially being an immigrant in Ireland was a big lesson because now I don't have to go around thinking, oh yeah, you know, I'm all alone and I will never make friends, but think, okay, it's possible for me to make friends with anyone. And I just need to open up and maybe talk to them and maybe join some community groups that will get me in connection with people who think like me and will see the world like me. And we even see the world differently, but are open to having those differences and accepting them. Thank you, Melody. Thank you very much uh, for sharing. Would anyone else like to respond to what they would carry with them? Nicole, please. Yes, um, I'll be very quick. Um, just three things that came into my head. The first one was um, the, the healing um, power of art actually works. I've been asking this question for 30 years and uh, Solus Irons gave me the answer. So thank you for that. And that was everybody. I just wanted to also say um, Martha and Michelle backstage uh, were just phenomenal. And uh, I think once you see their interview, I saw a little snippet and uh, I just think they need to get their own uh, talk show. So I'm just throwing that out there. My other thing is that there is no such thing as a solo show. It takes a village as we found out. And I also wanted to say one last thing that um, the, the absolute, the support is very important, obviously, and was there all the time, but the absolute crack 
uh, is so important. The crack, uh, and I mean the CRAIC crack, that we had during this um, with the women. I, I, I worked with them in a workshop around shoes. We had an absolute blast. The party, the dancing, the conversations, and that to me was a joy as much as all the other parts. So uh, the crack is absolutely uh, essential. That's it. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Aoife? Um, yeah, two, two takeaways, I think. Um, one of them is if Jenny McDonald has an idea, um, it's a really good idea to say yes. <laughs> um, but also, um, I think I, I took away a message about the way discourses are shaped and how that influences the voices you hear. Um, and this is something I know that we, we discussed around the, the talkbacks after the shows, but also around the, the way Jenny facilitated the collective. And that is when there's a supportive environment and, and there's something about that lack of ego and that lack of competition that fosters voices that maybe don't always come to the fore to do that. Um, and I, I learned a lot about how you set up a conversation can really um, influence what you hear and, and, and whose voices are represented in it. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to respond to that prompt? Uh, we do have another question waiting in the wings, so I will happily get to that. So Colin Smith, uh, wrote, wrote in and he'd like to know what was the biggest challenge um, uh, for the collective during the process, either individually or as a group? So give it a thought. Melody, yeah. I think the biggest challenge was choosing which stories to leave out <laughs> <laughs> because we had we every week we met we we told stories and then we put them on cards and then we lined them up and then when it came to choosing to fit a space that that was our biggest challenge because we all wanted it's funny because what we would do would then be like i want you to tell your story it was never like tell my story i when, and i remember people saying you need to tell this story and i was like why should I tell it? I don't want to tell it. And yet, you know, everyone was like, Melody, no, you need to tell this one. And so that's what we did with each other. We would gather up the stories and try to find which ones were, would also fit into a theme that was going to gel together. Because the falling was a story of all of us. Stories of all of us put into one, make, trying to make one story. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a result, it was quite challenging. But fun to do as well because you could see the encouragement and the care when we were encouraging everybody to be who they are and to tell, to have their own stories told. Thank you, Melody. Would anyone else like to respond to the challenges? Uh, Pauline, yes, please. Um, just one challenge that I would have thought at the time was quite difficult was when we were telling other people's stories. Um, because for me, I wanted to, if I was telling my own story, well and good, I'm telling my story. But when I was telling somebody else's story, I wanted to do that justice. I wanted to make it that who the story did belong to, to make them really feel, and for me to feel how they, they felt about the story. So that would have been a challenge at the time. But um I'm hoping we, we all did that, but, but it was, yeah, it would have been a challenge to just, to be, for me, to be able to portray somebody else's story the way they, they want it done. But um, again, I think because, of, because we were like a big family and we all gelled so well together, I think we, did, we got through that and we, we kind of got a feedback and we knew what people wanted and how they wanted their stories told. So yeah, that would have been a bit of a challenge, but I think we worked through it well enough. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. And again, it just, it speaks to that, that ethos of there was no ego, that you would all be so concerned with these, these precious stories uh, that maybe originally came from another individual, um, but that you were charged with, with caring for and sharing out uh, with the audience. Thank you very much. Um, do we have anyone else? I'm scrolling through. I don't want to miss anyone. All right, we're going to move on. We have another question that came in um, from Claire, and she's kind of bouncing off 
um, these ideas from the audience panel that there was constant feedback sought um, from the audience throughout the festival. Uh, and she was wondering, was there any audience feedback that prompted a change in the work or, or in a performance um, from weekend to weekend or maybe from evening, one evening to the next? Uh, Nicole, please. Okay, I'm just on mute now. Um, actually, it's 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 a really interesting one. I'm just following on from what Jen said earlier, um, and it kind of this really stayed with me. And it wasn't, I guess, it was feedback before it kind of even not feedback, but feedback of what what I, I had, what we had, and what I had thrown out. There were baggage, and I made that uh, kind of byline of this is not a a coming of age because she's a bit too old for that. This is a coming of rage, and. Then I got the feedback from Jen and from the women in the box office. And they cracked me up that women, a lot of women and middle-aged women like me, middle-aged women coming in and, and older and saying, I want to see the rage play. I want to see the one where the woman's had enough. And, uh, and I had kind of thrown that out about like kind of as a, you know yourself, it's age, rage, blah, blah. But I was like, Jesus Christ, I better have something. They cannot walk in and I have nothing to give them because there's people coming in here going, I'm here for the thing. I'm here to see the rage. I'm here to, to find a place to be mirrored or the window. I love that of my own rage and just to be able to say, I'm done here. I haven't had, I'll had enough now. And for it to actually be okay to do that. Um, and I, I can't, that was, that felt like then it became a responsibility. And I remember saying it to Deirdre. I was like, Jesus, we better have something. So um, that really stayed with me. Absolutely. And, and the fact that there was a, a space where a woman could express this rage. I, you know, I'm a little whirling, I think, back to the, the vice presidential uh, debate that occurred two, two days ago, I think. Or, yeah, not last night, the night before. And there are all of these people who are talking about how Kamala Harris had to really work so hard as a woman to not show rage and to not be able to express any sort of anger. Uh, in that space and, and you know, applauding her, her performance. And yet to hear, Nicole, that there was, a, there was a hunger for that. There was a hunger for being able to allow space for a woman to just respond with rage if she, if she needed to, but as she felt. Uh, so just, sorry, it made me think of that, that parallel because I'm seeing all of this uh, written in, in the media. Uh, yeah. And then I just, sorry, just to add as well, I, I also had the experience, obviously we had the Q&As, which were amazing, and I love them for the other pieces as well. But um, uh, for women coming up, uh, and men actually, coming up to me after and just kind of going, yeah, the rage. And like I had a lot of people uh, take my wrists and squeeze my wrists. So there was a lot of squeezing of hands and wrists. So uh, there was a lot of non-verbal and that was just really interesting. But I thought, yeah, the hunger in, and one man actually, that really, really touched me. It was a couple who came, I'd say they were in their probably late sixties, I don't know, but he just said, he thanked me on behalf of his wife. He said, the, 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 the convert, like he said, this is really, um, the, it, how, how it affected her prompted him to come up. And I just, that, that kind of got me, I'll get all emotion there, but that, that just stayed with me. And I was just like, you know, that's when you just go, Grant, my job is done here. I did my job. So that's it. Yeah. And that festival created that, that space for that. Uh, would anyone else like to respond to the question about uh, Jennifer Webster, please. Yeah, I think this was it was not feedback that we received from the general public, but it was probably feedback that the collective that we kind of gave ourselves was that the Q and A, the first Q and A, it's really hard. It's hard to sit up there and talk and respond to questions like we're doing here today. It's not an easy thing to do, and we realised when do we get a chance to actually rehearse that? We don't. So we took some time we took 10 minutes at the end then of our rehearsals and i pretended i was oprah and i went to run and we literally just started asking each other questions not necessarily about anything in particular but just to get ourselves into that habit of answering a question being the spotlight on you you know being yourself it's 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 a challenge but that was one feedback that we took from the first q a and i think we all felt that the more the q a's went on that we, we all started to feel 
a bit more comfortable, but they are nerve wracking and then it's hard to sit up there and, you know, respond. Yeah, no, it, it takes courage as, as, you know, we were talking about earlier. I think Ginny had the realization that she was a courageous woman in theater. And then she went out and said, I'm going to find more. <laughs> uh, and she did, she did. She found a, a whole crew. Um, are there any other, Melody, I think I see your hand. Yeah, I, I just remembered one feedback we got when we first did Falling initially in the Abbey. And uh, one of the men said, why didn't you say I come from Zimbabwe or whatever? And, and we were all like, that's not what we wanted to do. But he was so emphatic about it that, you know, he was like, you should have done that because I want to know that. And, and then afterwards, we all had a big discussion about it because we were like, no, we are not going to do what you want. We are going to do what we want. This is our play. <laughs> and it's so funny because that feedback stayed with us the whole time. And we kept sort of responding to it in a way, re-emphasizing what we wanted to do and what we wanted to say and how we wanted to say it without, you know, living up to expectations of, of, of the audience or the man, because this was a man and I think because he was a man and he was so emphatic about what he wanted, it's kind of, you know, like, was like, oh, there goes a man again trying to tell us what to do and how we should do it. And we're not doing that. It was funny. We didn't take it seriously, but it was also something we, we became very aware of and, and, and responded to. That was the only time we really actually responded to, you know, audience in that way. And that, you know, but the, most of the time we just said, okay, this is what we are doing. And hopefully they will love it more, as much as we do. Absolutely. And it's incredibly empowering that, you know, to, to be the courageous women making theater and to open yourselves up to feedback and to say, yes, we, we generously want this. But then again, to, to be able to know when to say no. You know, well, I'll listen to you, right? And you listened. And then at the end of the day, it was, you know, not, maybe not something that you wanted to, to, to pick up, but that you opened yourselves up to it is just really incredibly powerful. Um, are there any other responses or would anyone else like to speak to? Uh, Jacinta, uh, please. Oh, maybe Jacinta and then we'll go to Nelta. Hi. Um... Yeah, just feedback. I I actually didn't have any feedback that I could think of until Nicole spoke and reminded me about the couple. And I think maybe she, myself and herself might have had the same couple give us feedback. Uh, maybe, or else it's just she's after sparking a memory. But um, when I was going to see Nicole show Baggage, a couple came up to me. I'd been on the previous two weeks to Nicole and a couple came on to me and the man said, uh, he said, thanks so much for your show. It, he said, we had a son who died of heroin and we just really, we were able to see his struggles uh, during your play, which was about addiction. And up until that point, and this might sound mad that I wrote a show about addiction, I'd written the show about eating disorders and addiction, but I kind of wrote it with young women in, in mind because I didn't want them to go through the same struggles that I had with bulimia and the whole lot, and I didn't want them to feel like the only ones. But I never really thought about audience members that were coming that might have had families uh, die to addiction. So when I performed the show after Solo Sirens to audiences, I, I went around schools then with it. But that bit of feedback kind of informed my performance in, more, in thinking about the audience and their experiences and that I don't know what everyone is going through or thinking and just, I suppose I just opened my heart to the possibility that there's audience there that have family members who've died from this. So it was a lovely feedback to get. And it was a lovely space to get it in because uh, this is th what I'm finding, even with this symposium, that the festival was so much more than I gave a credence for at the time, if you know what I mean. And I'm, I'm really grateful for this symposium today for, for just opening me up and making me think about it and the framework and how I got that feedback because I was there to see someone else showing the festival and the same audience were seeing my show and horror show and the next show and just how it all tied together. I just think, yeah, it was just, it's very important 
and the discussions are great. Thank you. Thank you very much to Senta and, and Melta. Well, uh, for me, for for me, one of the things that that I found we we got as a group was because everyone else performed before us, uh, Jenny, uh, Jacinta, and Nicole. So we took bits from their feedback and uh, some of what they did, and some of it is like our own feedback. Say, hmm, we need more movement because we saw the dance and Yuma because. Uh, Jacinta was talking about a hard subject but added humor to it so the feedback of the audience to them helped us put in other bits to us and it actually helped us enliven and bring our own personalities to the fore because we we had not I don't know besides uh, Jen and Jenny the, the performers had not created any performance before so we're like looking at it and thinking we have so much fun in here but our piece is so serious so let's try to inject something into it and that feedback helped and um, yeah so that's kind of what we got from their work and their feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelta. And uh, I want to thank everyone on the panel for, for spending the time with us today and for being willing to speak about your experiences um, throughout the festival leading up to and, and after. And it, it does seem like the festival was a bit like the ocean, like it just keeps kind of coming back on us with waves and um, it kind of recedes and the tide comes in, the tide goes out, but it's, it's staying with us. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you to all of our attendees. Um, I believe I'm going to pass it over to it Jen or Jenny to introduce Me. the next show. Yeah. Ladies. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to Kate. Um, and thank you to all of you on both those panels because, um, as was said, reflection was such an important part of the festival, not just having a consumer approach to art, but really taking it in, considering it, chewing on it a bit. Um, and it's, it's really lovely to hear all the experiences that you had, um, both as participating artists and as participating audience. Um, so we're going to go to a video now. We also had a wonderful opportunity in the course of our preparations for Soul the Sirens, and that was for the collective to do a week at the Abbey Theatre as part of 5x5. Five five. So last week I had a chance to catch amidst um, many, many things that she's up to at the moment to catch up with Jen Coppinger. Jen's the head of producing at the Abbey. So we have a video now uh, that's a chat between myself and Jen about five by five about its impact on us and also about this bigger question of where we are at in terms of gender and theater uh, so we'll go to that video now thank you again to all the panelists and the moderators <laughs> 